invite us in? Yeah, we're recording now. Okay, great. Welcome, everybody. Um, on behalf of the Peace and Justice Studies Association, I want to welcome you to this session on the value of e-mediation in high conflict disputes. I am Allison Castell. I'm on the board of the Peace and Justice Studies Association and I'm one of the organizers of this conference. Um, and I just am so thrilled that we have Christy Foley here today to lead us in a workshop. And if anybody is interested in becoming a member of Peace and Justice Studies, please visit our website and feel free to do so. I wanna start by just telling you a little bit about um, Christy even though this is the first time I'm meeting her, it's such a pleasure. And she's been mediating since 2009 where she started in New York City. And now she is part of the Florida Supreme Court. She's certified in the Florida Supreme Court as a mediator. She's also a certified circuit civil mediator and she's mediated privately, in person, online and has volunteered regularly at Orange County Courthouse. Uh, she has an extensive resume here, and we are so fortunate to have her um, teaching us and working with us today. And so I don't want to take up too much time. I'd love to have Christy be the center here. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. And I'll, I'll pass it to you, Christy. Thank you so much, Allison. Yeah, um, so I actually, back in 2018, started doing these e-mediations. And everyone kind of looked at me and said, oh, that's interesting and kind of neat and sounds like the wave of the future. Maybe one day that'll catch on. Um, and then of course COVID hit and everyone started doing e-mediations. And so now the question really is kind of looking forward, what types of cases are most likely to continue to operate in the e-mediation sphere as opposed to the in-person fear once the threat of the COVID pandemic passes? Um, so tonight what I want to go ahead and talk about is those kinds of cases that you might see um, in your you know, local courthouse, in your mediation practice, they are likely to stay e-mediated cases as opposed to in-person cases moving forward. Um, and we'll talk about some reasons why e-mediation is helpful in certain types of cases, as well as how you can identify the cases that might be right for e-mediation as opposed to an in-person mediation. So there are a number of different types of high conflict cases, right? Probably the first thing that comes to your mind is any kind of divorce or custody case, especially if domestic violence is involved or claims to be involved, which statistics show up to about 50% of divorces might contain some level of domestic violence, whether it be emotional or physical. Um, another type of case that tends to be very high in conflict are community mediations and criminal mediations. Um, do any of you have experience with criminal or even community mediation? Okay, so it's actually pretty rare. There are very few jurisdictions that are doing any kind of criminal mediation. Community mediation is more common. I've done a good bit of community mediations. Um, and you run into a problem where people are living in the same sphere. So developing a solution that is good for them and that will last for them as well as the other people in their sphere, their family, their friends can be quite a bit of a challenge. And often they'll come into the mediation with that feeling that they've got the weight of the whole neighborhood behind them. Um, and so that tends to make it a high conflict dispute. You'll also see evictions tend to be very high conflict, um, as well as family disputes, whether it be elder probate disputes or even business disputes that involve family members. Um, often we can wind up with a lot more emotional um, issues arising in our mediations at that time at least more so than your traditional business dispute. So those are all the kinds of cases that you may wanna be thinking about having a more high conflict nature. 
um, so that you can try and identify them and know whether an e-mediation would be the appropriate format as opposed to an in-person mediation. And there are a few things to look at besides just the nature of the case when you're trying to make that kind of identification. Number one, pre-mediation statements, phone calls with the parties and if possible, their attorneys, um, that will really help you to know whether this is a super high conflict dispute. Um, I encourage you, if you're you know, mediating regularly, you very well may have discovered that people don't give you pre-mediation statements um, and that's okay. You can make phone calls. You can give them a call and say, hey, just wanted to remind you, we have a mediation tomorrow. Um, can you please tell me a little bit about this dispute? What should I expect? Ask questions like, well, should the parties be in the same room? How do you feel about them being in the same room, whether it be virtually or in person, things of that nature. It's a great time to feel out the parties or their counsel if they have attorneys representing them. And if you can't at least do that much, then if there is a court case filed, looking at the pleadings, looking at relevant counterclaims, that can all give you an indication of whether this conflict is the type that would be extremely emotional and perhaps even physically frightening for one of the parties. You know, if you see that there are issues with injunctions or there are claims of even defamation, um, a lot of times a defamation claim is a good clue for me that this is a very high conflict dispute. We've got someone who's willing to say a lot of negative, untruthful things, and we've got someone who's sensitive to that. So putting them in an e-mediation can often be better than putting them in the room together at that point. So be sure to at least look through the pleadings if that's an option for you as well. What types of cases do you all tend to handle? Any particular type of mediation work that you tend to do? I mean, I'm not a mediator. I mean, if I were doing any kind of me mediating, it would be, you know, at the university, you know, maybe, um, and not in like a formal sense anymore. I mean, I, I, I trained in mediation many years ago um, in a community, community mediation center. Um, but I don't know about others, if other people have any experience with mediation. Yeah. So I'm a law student. I'm not a qualified mediator, but we do run a legal aid clinic in my college. So I do mostly domestic violence related mediations with them. Okay. So those can get pretty emotional uh, pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Very nice. Okay. So yeah, community mediation experience, domestic mediation experience, you ladies know exactly what I'm talking about here. <laughs> but of course, when you have a high conflict dispute and you're bringing people together in the same room for a traditional in-person mediation, you actually can come across some pretty serious problems. Number one, you could potentially be putting the party's safety in jeopardy. Number two, you as a mediator might be jeopardizing your own safety as well. Uh, number three, it often makes the logistics more challenging for the mediator to make sure that the parties stay separated and stay safe when they're in the same building or the same general space. Um, and then to top it all off, when people are fearful or overly emotional because they're in the same space with someone who's causing them a lot of negative emotions, that's going to decrease their ability to think logically and resolve problems. So you're also making the mediation harder on everyone. Um, and we'll take a look at each of these in a little more detail. But these are kind of the main reasons that I want you to start thinking about really making sure that cases with high conflict stay in the e-mediation sphere moving forward. Um, of course, if people are fearful of their own safety, let's say you have a community mediation involving bullying, you have a domestic mediation involving domestic violence, um, either physical or emotional, you know, 
having someone in your mediation who has that fear is really going to shut down the conversations. It often paralyzes parties. It makes it hard for them to communicate what they really want, um, which obviously makes the mediator's job much more challenging. But it also means that they're unlikely to actually commit to a final agreement at the end of your mediation. Um, they're uncertain about what they should do because of that fear. So it's harder to get a resolution to their dispute. And it makes it harder for a party who's feeling fearful to really speak openly um, and talk about what they truly want, which is often why they hold back on signing a settlement because they find that the agreement isn't what they really wanted. But they didn't talk about what they really wanted because they were too scared to express their opinions. So of course the agreement doesn't reflect what they really want. Um, so it's very challenging for a mediator to get an effective settlement agreement that the parties will follow through on in such a scenario. Um, plus, on the other side of the table, for the person who is actually inducing some sort of fear, you know, it's very hard for the mediator or the other party to push someone who's doing that about the weak points in their case. So it's hard for a mediator to effectively do her job and really move someone off of their stance. If that person is threatening the mediator or even the other party, it can be hard for the other party who knows the case better than the mediator to mention those little loopholes that might help the mediator start poking holes in the arguments. Um, and therefore, it's hard to have an effective mediation in person when you have that kind of scenario. I know I once did a mediation that was at our local courthouse and um, the captain of the police force was actually one of the parties. And when he came to the mediation, um, he just walked in the courthouse fully armed in full uniform and everyone thought he was just there on official police business, but he was actually a party to mediation. So he walks into my mediation room. He gets extremely upset with the other party. Uh, they were dealing with an emotional issue regarding a pet that was killed. And so it was very personal and emotional. And when the captain and the police force got upset, he's um, probably about 6'2", very tall guy. Um, I'm about 5'3", for comparison. Um, and he stands up and he starts pointing at the other person like in their face and yelling at them. And he is so enraged. I can literally see the veins in his neck popping. And he went from perfectly calm to completely enraged in about 20 seconds. It was a very sharp turnaround. And as a mediator in that moment, you don't necessarily know what to do, right? You don't know, okay, do I jump in front of this party and protect them? How do I regain control of the mediation? What do I do here? Luckily, I'm in a courthouse. Do I hit the giant red button on the wall and ask the other cops to come on in and save us? I have no idea, but the guy with the gun, he's really mad right now and that can't be good. Um, and so for whatever reason, instinctively, I said, I need to take control of this mediation. I stood up and I said, sir, if you're gonna continue in my mediation, you need to sit down, take a deep breath and continue in a rational manner. And for whatever reason, he listened to me. Um, to this day, I don't quite know why. Um, probably the fact that normally in a mediation, I'm very conversational. And so me actually taking a sharper tone and standing up uh, kind of reminded him as a quick cue. Oh yeah, this is like a business meeting in a courthouse. This isn't a good time for me to act crazy. But that's the thing. From that moment forward, I was acutely aware in my head, I cannot make this guy get too upset. This guy is armed. And that's something that honestly, before that mediation had never dawned on me, probably because I mainly, you know, mediate business disputes and things that are pretty civil in nature. Um, I'm not, you know, negotiating any kind of scary conflicts here in the community. So 
that's probably why I wasn't aware of it before. But that case was a real, um, I guess, game changer for me in realizing just how important it is to keep people's emotions in check because you never know when they might turn and you never know the impact it may have on you as a mediator as well as the other party. And that leads me to my next point. If you are mediating in a place that's not a courthouse or that doesn't have its own security, then that means you as a mediator are usually in charge of figuring out the security situation for that mediation. So you need to make sure you're mediating in a building where there's security personnel and you're paying them usually um, or you're paying for it through your rent you have to generally coordinate with them to make sure that someone is escorted to their vehicle or local public transport or something like that after the mediation. Um, you also probably need to stagger the timing of when you tell each party to arrive at the mediation. And then of course, when each party is leaving, you also have to figure out how to separate them as much as possible when they're in the same building and make sure that their break times are staggered and kind of supervised so that no one winds up in the coffee break room at the same time if they're going to, you know, be fearful of the other person or so no one winds up hitting the restroom at the same time when there's a threat of domestic violence. Um, that puts a lot of stress on the mediator and the mediator staff. And those are a lot of logistics to be thinking about if you're going to do a in-person mediation. The cool thing about an e-mediation, though, is that all of those concerns magically disappear. And in e-mediation, it's very easy to say, OK, well, I'm on Zoom. I have a waiting room. I'm going to admit one person to the waiting room, put them in a breakout room. Then I'll admit the next person to the waiting room and put them in a breakout room. You can control exactly where everyone is at any given moment, and you don't worry about them interacting with each other. So that makes it a lot easier on you as the mediator. It also makes it a lot safer for the parties and for the mediator. So for the parties, they don't have to worry about, okay, when I arrive at the mediation, how do I get from my car or from the local subway stop to the building safely? What if this person is there? What if they're watching me? You know, what if they try and intimidate me before the mediation? Something like that. Um, same when they're leaving. So if you are able to move these high conflict disputes into an e-mediation as opposed to an in-person mediation, you'll find that the parties will often be more candid with you because they'll be more relaxed, they'll be more open uh, because that fear factor has really been removed for them to a great extent at least. So you're more likely to make progress and reach a resolution. And of course, for you as the mediator, that's also comforting, right? You are not the mediator who's sitting there wondering, okay, well, is the guy who's mad and armed going to take it out on me because I'm mediating and not just giving him what he wants? Um, so you don't have to worry about physical harm during the mediation or even when you're leaving as well. You know, there are some contentious disputes. People walk out in mediation and depending on how you wanna look at it, uh, you can either say everyone's equally unhappy or you can say nobody's satisfied um, when they compromise. And I like to be an optimist. I like to say everyone's equally unhappy, um, but at the same time, you know, there is some truth to that. People compromise when they're in a mediation, at least if they're reaching a resolution, chances are they had to compromise a little bit and if it's a particularly contentious mediation, the mediator may actually be fearful upon leaving that someone who isn't happy with the compromise is actually going to take it out on the mediator in some way, shape or form, whether it just be yelling at the mediator or um, anything more serious than that. So the mediator doesn't have to necessarily worry about safety during an e-mediation, which is lovely. And it really does allow the mediator to focus on her job, be more candid, push the parties a little bit more um, so that she can try and help them reach a resolution that they are pretty happy with in the grand scheme of things. Um, plus, 
if you're not having to manage threats and people's fearfulness and things like that, you're going to have a more productive and more efficient mediation as well. So e-mediation, of course, um, you're probably seeing by now, is a pretty helpful alternative to in-person mediations during these high conflict disputes. Yes, it's because of separate locations, right? Having the space for the parties is obviously valuable. Um, and having limited opportunities to interact is also very valuable. However, there are a few other benefits as well. Number one, it helps parties to focus better. And number two, there are actually some pieces of an e-mediation that help to equalize the parties. So we'll talk about all that. But when it comes to separate locations, it definitely helps parties to feel safer. Um, and it's actually kind of nice, right? Because when I look at everybody's picture here on this particular meeting, I have no idea where you are unless you tell me you could be in the next room over from me, or you could be halfway around the world and I have no idea. You can actually keep your location a secret if you want to. And so that's something that is very comforting to a lot of people in some of these high conflict disputes. You know, they're often trying to separate themselves from the person on the other side emotionally. And even if it's just a business deal gone wrong, you know, um, they want to be able to separate and move on with their lives. And having that physical separation can help to emphasize that and help them feel the relief at the end of the mediation that this is actually happening and they're getting that separation that they desired. Um, and therefore, they'll be more relaxed. So they'll be more open about what they really want with the mediator. Um, and hopefully in those discussions, they'll be able to give the mediator more information about, okay, here's what I really need in order to be able to move forward so that they can come to a resolution that they're comfortable following through with. Um, the other nice thing, of course, is that when you have that distance, you're actually decreasing the likelihood of threats, right? So for example, for me to stand up would be completely ineffective right now if I was trying to threaten someone, I would actually look silly doing that. Even for me to get close to the camera and point at someone, it just looks silly. It doesn't look threatening necessarily. And so when you're doing an e-mediation, having those separate locations actually forces people to use their words more and forces them to express their emotions in a healthier way because they can't use all of the body language that they normally would to express their anger um, or you know, fear or anything like that. So it's actually forcing them to communicate more effectively, which is really nice. Plus, you're not having any of those visceral reactions to the other person being in the room with you, right? So have any of you ever been really mad at someone to the point where you understood the phrase, my blood was boiling? Yeah, of course, we've all been there at some point in our lives, right? And that feeling like, oh, my blood is boiling. I'm so mad at this person. Well, that takes over physiologically. That takes over your whole body. It makes you tense up. It makes you solely focused on how angry you are. And it actually decreases your ability to think logically. And if you're not physically in the same space with someone, it's much more challenging for you to get that angry with someone. Um, so by taking some of these high conflict disputes into an e-mediation setting, you actually are able to negate a lot of those instinctive emotional reactions that are hurting the mediation process, making it more challenging for the parties to reach a resolution. So e-mediation is helpful in that regard as well. And then of course, limiting the interactions, right? You can admit them at different times. You can make sure that they're in separate breakout rooms the whole time. So they never actually interact with each other. And the logistics of doing that are quite simple. There's not a lot of pre-planning that really needs to go into it. There's no added expense or hassle really for the mediator, which is a nice perk. 
Um, the one thing I would say is that if you are me mediating a high conflict dispute and you know you're not going to let the parties even see each other in the virtual conference room, you might want to warn them of that ahead of time because sometimes emotionally parties are kind of ramping themselves up to see the other person, to face the other person, to even just have to see their picture on the screen. And if you can relax them before they even go into the mediation and let them know, hey, yeah, when you come in and log into that e-mediation, I'm gonna put you right in a breakout room. I'm gonna put the other side in their breakout room. You guys probably won't see each other at all, but I'll be going between the two breakout rooms so we can make progress in an efficient manner. If you can just let the parties know that, it's often really helpful in getting them to relax. Frankly, I think anytime you can be transparent with the parties about what you're doing, it's going to help build trust in you and get them to relax about the process as a whole. Um, so I think it's really important to do that in general, but particularly in this scenario. And then as I mentioned, a lot of the body language cues people might use to be intimidating or cause fear or something of that nature actually are harder for people to do in an e-mediation. Um, you know, I was in one mediation, it was technically a business dispute, but it was a husband and wife who were simultaneously going through a divorce. And it seemed to me like there were probably some, um, maybe not domestic violence, physical violence kind of tendencies, but emotional tendencies in it. And it, it was an in-person dispute. And occasionally she would say something and he would just kind of wrap his nails on the table and she would shut up immediately. She would just go quiet and end her sentence right then. And I quickly picked up on that, was able to separate them and figure out that that was his way of intimidating her. Um, before he would start yelling at her traditionally, it came out that he would do that. That was kind of his nervous tick or his, um, I guess, kind of like his poker face, right? His tell in poker. And so that's why she was immediately quieting when he would do that. But in an e-mediation, you can't tell usually if someone is tapping their fingers on a table. They would have to do something pretty obvious in order for you to notice it and in order for the other person to notice it, which makes it much less likely to be effective. Um, and therefore it'll help the parties to really speak openly and um, not to feel as intimidated. The other interesting thing about an e-mediation is that as a mediator, if you're the host of the meeting, the organizer of the meeting, you actually have the ability to either mute participants if necessary, or remove them from the e-mediation if they're not behaving properly. And that's a power that you really don't have in person. Um, I'm very fortunate, knock on wood, that I have not had to use either of those features thus far, but it is something that I like having as a safety net. You know, um, if things were to get out of hand, I can mute everyone and take control over the mediation again. Or if someone is saying threatening things, and this is a case that cannot be resolved because of those threats, I can remove that person from the mediation room, um, something that physically I'd be unlikely to be able to do in person. So e-mediations give me an advantage there. The other interesting thing about the e-mediation format is that it actually helps to equalize the parties. So studies have shown that because on Zoom or whatever real e-mediation platform you're using, everyone is in a box that's the same size. Physical size is no longer intimidating, right? I mean, I know I'm a short girl. I have no problem admitting it. I often wear heels to feel a little taller. Um, and that's my way of trying to equalize myself when I'm in a mediation room. But that's something that is completely irrelevant in an e-mediation. Um, same with physical size being intimidating in any way to, from one party to another or even to the mediator. Um, so that can truly help psychologically to equalize the parties and make them less fearful. They're more willing to speak up for themselves. They're more willing to be candid with the mediator about what they really want 
when they feel like they're on an equal playing field with everyone in the room. The other interesting thing is that most e-mediation software has some sort of volume equalizer. So it's very rare that you'll have one person come through extremely hot on the microphone and one person come through very low. Um, typically, the software will try and even that out at least a little bit. It's not quite as noticeable as it would be in person, which also helps if emotions do get out of hand. You know, the yelling is not as intense as it would be in person, and therefore it's not as detrimental to the mediation process either. Um, the other good thing, of course, is that you can't randomly pop up somewhere in a Zoom meeting, right? The host, the mediator always knows where you are. Um, I've heard of a few disputes where, you know, the mediator will lay down the rules with parties, particularly in some family law domestic disputes. And the mediator will say at the beginning, look, you've got this side of the hall. The other person has this side of the hall. You each have your own bathroom. You each have your own coffee station. You are not to go near the other person's side of the hall. And sure enough, one person will go to the other side of the hall um, in order to try and intimidate the other person. And that's something you don't have to worry about if you're doing an e-mediation. Neither party can try and kind of gain an upper hand, so to speak, by unexpectedly popping up somewhere that they shouldn't be. Um, and as mediator, you're in control of the whole thing. You're in control of when parties move to different breakout rooms. You're in control of whether a party stays in the virtual conference or gets removed from it, whether a party can screen share or has a microphone that's turned on or anything like that. So it helps to empower the mediator in some of these high conflict disputes where the mediator needs to take a little more control. And then of course, if you are able to remove that fear and you're able to remove that hostility and all those negative, not all those, who am I kidding? Some of those negative emotions, then you will actually see that the parties are much better at focusing on the dispute itself. Um, so as I mentioned, warning the parties in advance, hey, you don't have to worry about seeing the other person, even on a little Zoom box. It's not going to happen. That can help them stay calm going into the mediation. They'll have that relief going into the process. And so instead of coming into the mediation, feeling tense, thinking that they're going to have to see the other person in this virtual conference, they'll know they can actually be calm. Hey, I'm just seeing the mediator today. That sense of calm is going to help get things off on the right foot during the mediation. Um, and it's going to remove a lot of the fear for them so that they can focus on the issues from a more logical perspective as opposed to a, an emotional perspective. I've also found that if parties get emotional, then you're able to remind them during an e-mediation about their safety. You're able to remind them, look, if you need a minute to take some deep breaths, to walk around the room or the house or whatever it is you're in, please feel free to do that. You've got a safe space there. You can take the time that you need. You've got plenty of distance from the other person. Go ahead, get calm, and then we'll continue. And having that safety zone is really helpful as well, because if conflict does escalate during the mediation for any reason, then having that ability to calm themselves down in a safe space helps them to really be able to come back and refocus on the issues so that they can move forward with the mediation process. So at this time, I know we only have about 10 minutes left. I wanted to go ahead and open it up and see if you have any questions for me about some of the advantages of e-mediation or in general, anything about high conflict disputes. First, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. It's like, it looked like everybody was frozen. I'm like, not again. No, oh, you're great. You oh, you're I know, I know very little about mediation, but I know some friends of mine uh, who went through it over a divorce and stuff, and it was just interesting to listen to. 
and there wasn't that danger element but as you were talking i'm like wow i could see how zoom or that kind of thing could be really instrumental in helping getting over some of those hurdles and stuff so thank you you're welcome what kind of work do you do swasti I teach, well, I did teach, but I, I teach philosophy and religion. I do applied ethics. So. Very nice. Yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah, so you know how differently people can think, right? So you know how that can cause conflict in a mediation setting and just how problematic that could be. Right. right. Yeah. Allison. Thank you. Yeah, very illuminating. and. It really makes sense how, you know, especially in the way that you presented it, how beneficial it can be to put people in, in a virtual space. And I guess, you know, one question I have is about, you know, and I don't know the, I, I don't know, cause I don't have a lot of experience with mediation, but is there anything gained or is there anything actually that is potentially lost by having them on just out of curiosity, just in the sense of like, if being in person um, provides the conditions for people to have to self-regulate better, or if it, you know, puts more responsibility on people to manage the space and their emotions and to actually work through things. I don't know. I mean, I'm just curious if, yeah. and maybe just because it's high, you know, high dispute that you're talking about that it's that it's different. But I, I just, I just was thinking about how it also excuses people in a way takes, you know, allows them to not have to work at yeah. something. I don't know, just curious your thoughts. No, I think that's a terrific point. I mean, I would wholeheartedly agree with you. The fact that people might try and use this in a mediation that would be uncomfortable um, instead of a mediation that would be threatening or, you know, jeopardizing any kind of physical or emotional safety. Um, I think if you are trying to use it simply kind of as an escape, so you're not uncomfortable, you're probably not regulating yourself appropriately. I agree completely about that. Um, but kind of like your point at the end, you know, I think we really should be looking at e-mediation uh, at least in one regard for continuing past the pandemic for some of those more threatening cases. Um, because I do think you're right in the sense of if you're just trying to get out of that uncomfortable feeling, then that's probably something you should deal with and you should be in an in-person mediation for that. But if safety is an issue, then an e-mediation is probably the best way to go. Excellent point. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, anything like that? Hi. Um, I, I was just thinking about this. So uh, it's been very hard for us to actually do any mediations during the pandemic itself. And that's been mainly because of the fact that the people that we work with are generally people who, are, who aren't capable of both affording like technological equipment that's necessary to do like a zoom meeting and all of that and also because they lack the technical skill even if they could download it on like a smartphone and right all of that. so i think um just with respect to the point about equalizing parties i think it's also kind of important to think about whether both parties have the same level of yeah. ability to use a platform that's online yeah. because like while i think a lot of the world is moving towards being able to use technology in a, in the effective way that, that it is it's been doing this these past few months there's also a large part of like the underprivileged sections that aren't as um that don't have as much exposure as as is necessary i think because I, I think it's also frustrating sometimes to deal with technology and then you're frustrated with that and then you're also frustrated right. with the um or the party or the, the situation itself Yes. But I think it's it's super interesting to I, I like listening to you. I really think that it's something that we should start considering and it's really interesting to see all of the benefits that that definitely exist within the situation. Yeah, it can be really helpful, but like you said, you know, it can be challenging for parties who 
either don't have internet access, don't have smart devices or computers, um, or just parties who aren't very tech savvy. Um, I know, you know, I tend to call people ahead of time, make sure they're comfortable with the e-mediation platform, let them know if they need a little Zoom tutorial, I can give them that. Um, so that on the day of the mediation, they will feel comfortable with it. I also know a lot of people who are actually sending out those Zoom tablets to parties and saying, okay, here's a Zoom tablet. As long as you have internet access, here's how you connect it. And they have like a little sheet of step-by-step -step instructions on what to do. And then they just ask, here's a prepaid postage please put this back in the box after your mediation and mail it back to our mediation office. Um, so I know a lot of people who are kind of doing different workarounds. Um, however, everyone winds up coming to the same conclusion. If you're dealing with people who don't have access to the internet, this obviously isn't gonna work, right? So that's kind of where we start encountering that access to justice problem unfortunately, uh, because you want to be in a secure place. You want to have a confidential setting, some place where you feel like you can speak openly during your mediation. So it's not like you can just run to the local McDonald's and use the Wi-Fi there for this kind of thing. Um, I think one of the reasons that different online dispute resolution programs have been successful, um, I'm not sure if you are familiar with it, but there are some programs kind of like the one on eBay that help people to negotiate a settlement online. Um, and they've actually increased access to justice because you don't need to be talking and engaging in a live conversation. You can be writing on your computer. No one necessarily sees what you're writing. So it's easier for you to do that in a public space if you need to get internet in public um, as opposed to an e-mediation. So that's where we really do see a limit to e-mediations and access to justice issues come into play um, as opposed to like an ODR format. But I think there are a few workarounds for people who just aren't very tech savvy or who don't have the right equipment. There are a few different things that can be done if either the mediator or the attorneys involved are willing to invest that time, energy and potentially equipment into it. Um, but it certainly takes extra effort on their part to make that happen and a willingness on the part of the participants to give it a shot as well. I know I've had a few people who have been hesitant to embrace e-mediations and I just tell them, look, I'm going to give you step-by-step -step instructions. I'm going to talk you through it on the phone. And if that doesn't work, then you know what? We'll put you on speakerphone and we'll let you participate via phone. And they're like, okay, cool. And knock on wood, so far, no one has had to participate via speakerphone, but they love knowing that there's a backup. They love knowing, okay, if this technology thing doesn't work out, you know, I'll still participate. It won't be the end of the world. Um, so I'll give it a shot and see what happens has kind of been their attitude when I've been able to lay their fears a bit. And fortunately that's worked out well. Yeah, that's really interesting to have a plan B. I think that's that's a really important. Oh, definitely. Um, definitely. And, you know, even just altering your opening statement to mention, hey, if you have internet problems, if you get kicked off, um, here's what we're going to do. Here's my cell phone number. Please text me if you have problems. If I see you get kicked off, I'm going to give you a call or I'm going to text you and I'm going to loop you back in and help talk you through the problems. I think just knowing someone is there as a safety net and is there to support you uh, makes people more comfortable and helps them to embrace a new process more easily. Any other questions, comments, anything? Okay, well, in that case, I just wanna thank you all for your time today. I certainly appreciate it. And if you do need anything moving forward, you have questions, 
you just want to chat about different e-mediation stuff, uh, feel free to email me. My email address is cfoley at emediationservices.com and I'm certainly happy to uh, help it wherever I can. Thank you so much, Christy, for introducing our community to this um, probably going to be a wave of the future. I mean, I just don't see that online services going anywhere anytime soon. So it's pretty critical to have people who are pioneering it and, you know, showing us some of the ways forward. So really, really appreciate the work that you're doing and that you're willing to come and share with us at the PGSA. So thank, thank you for so having much. me. Thank you everyone for joining our session. Bye everyone. <laughs>